Hello, welcome to API Conversations. I'm Marcia Barnhart, Chief of Investigations for the Aerial Phenomenon Investigations Team, and your host for this episode. You may be familiar with our podcast, API Case Files. In that program, we showcase UFO sightings investigations that are underway or just recently closed. We discuss multiple investigations typically, looking at and dissecting the parameters of a case, unusual aspects of the sighting, and how we came to our findings. But API Conversations, this program, is markedly different. In this program, we feature a one-on-one, in-depth conversation, hence the name, with a noted personage in the UFO, UAP, or anomalous experience field. It provides the opportunity to let us know someone beyond the scope of the work that brought them to our attention in the first place. My guest today is Cheryl Costa. She and her research partner, co-writer, and wife, Linda Costa, a master librarian with background work in scientific research and publishing, have produced a -a one-of-a-kind publication. To my knowledge, correct me if I'm wrong, this is the only work of its kind in existence, a desk reference of unidentified flying objects covering a 15-year time span from 2001 to 2015 of UFO sightings reported in the United States. The information was taken from raw sightings reported to the two main U.S. UFO reporting sites, the Mutual UFO Network, typically known as MUFON, and the National UFO Reporting Center, NUFORC. It's hard to overstate just how much time, energy, and more impressively, specialized expertise it took to compile this raw data, arrange it into usable statistical information and into graphs and charts that detail the frequency, distribution, and shapes of reported aerial phenomena within the United States. More than 120,000 individual reports were ingested, sorted, and placed into state-level, then county-level information by month for all 50 states and the District of Columbia. In my opinion, a monumental accomplishment. So, of course, I bought the book. I mean, it's a desk reference, and I have already found it of value as a research tool while conducting UFO investigations for API. If you are an investigator or researcher, you will find it of value, too. And hopefully, our local libraries will have it. And if so, it will be placed properly in the reference section of the library. Here in part one of API Conversations with Cheryl Costa, we talk about the book UFO Sightings Desk Reference and about her background. A native New Yorker, Cheryl is a U.S. Naval and U.S. Air Force veteran. She's a published playwright, a filmmaker, a talk radio host, a banker, an ordained Buddhist nun, a disclosure activist, and a devotee of mind and consciousness study. I spoke with Cheryl and recorded the following conversation on February 28, 2018. She starts by detailing her life after leaving the military and beginning her work in the aerospace industry, eventually as an analyst, which, interestingly enough, created the perfect skill set to design information systems that assist in the analysis of large amounts of data, the capability that gave rise to this book. My training was in microwave work. I went to work up in Owego, New York in 1980. 
Uh, I started out in product tests because I had uh, that kind of electronics background. And uh, I was uh, in, a, in a test lab, so to speak. And then what ended up happening was um, I worked second shift. So I was going to school daytime to film school over at SUNY Binghamton. And uh, State University of New York at Binghamton is what that is. And uh, somebody said, could you make industrial movies for us? And I said, well, we can try. They rented me equipment, a t- test amount of equipment. And I, I made a few sample uh, training films for them. They loved them. And uh, next thing you know, for the next four years, I, I made about 65, 70 uh, training films. But I burned out. So what happened was uh, I, I got offered a position down in Virginia, and uh, I took it. And that's how I got in the Manassas, Virginia area, essentially put me within a you know 30-minute drive of D.C. And from there on, that was in uh, 86. So I was down there pretty much for the next 25 years or so. Um, now, I was in D.C., working downtown in, in M Street in D.C., mm-hmm. from 98 to 2014 when I retired. And I see that you had a Paranormal Topics talk show there from 98 to 2001. Man, I wish I would have heard about that. What time was that on? It was on um, Channel 33 out of Arlington. It was a cable channel. Oh, I see. But the deal was, it was about American witchcraft, the first time that ever that anybody has ever produced a weekly talk show on American witchcraft. And so what happened was, and I was producing it, so um, we got Larry King's attention, uh, the Associated Press did a huge story on us, uh, and over the next 10 months of the show, we did 88 international interviews about the program that we produced for about 50 bucks a week. All right. And then sometime along in there, uh, you became a creative writer, and uh, you went to school for that, right? Well, sort of. I actually, I went to film school. And what happened was I made a sci- I made a science fiction movie, and uh, somebody made a VHS copy of it and took it over. Uh, this is like in the early '80s before I started making industrial films, and uh, somebody took the copy over to the theater department. Now at the SUNY Binghamton, the theater department and the f- film department didn't talk to each other, so we had this art film department, and then you had a classical theater department. And somebody took a copy of my 55-minute science fiction movie, low-budget science fiction movie, over to the playwright and um, uh, media writing pro- professor over there, Dr. Lofton Mitchell. Uh, he's, by the way, he was a Broadway playwright. And uh, he watched my film, and next thing I know, people, they've made an appointment. I've been told i got to come over and talk to the guy, and I did. And I said, I, I can't afford to take another English class where I'm going to get an F because everybody marks up myself with a red pen. You know, I was carrying, I was carrying a, a, a three, eight, three, eight average over in the film department. He looked at me and says, look, you can pass my class by coming to every single lecture, or you can pass my class by coming to the first three lectures and then going out and make, uh, writing a script or something. And he said, uh, or if he could at least make a halfway decent treatment, you know, seven-page treatment of maybe a movie or a television program. And I looked at him and said, okay, yeah, I understand that. And he says, but you went out and actually made the movie. Yeah, I want you in my program. So he gave me for that movie, he gave me the first two semesters worth of credit for doing, just doing the movie. I see. Okay. Kind of like clapping some credits, huh? Yeah, yeah, I did. I did. Essentially, that amounted to clapping credit. So I was actually in his program as a writer for uh, the last two semesters of the two-year the two year program. And uh, I didn't finish at SUNY Binghamton, amazingly enough. It was another, uh, God, it was another 35, 40 years before I actually finished. I didn't finish until I, I, brought, clep- I brought all my credit from uh, SUNY Binghamton, a couple of community colleges here and there, and things like this, and uh, Empire State, uh, SUNY, I'm saying, let me say this correctly, State University of New York at, at Empire State College. And uh, 2013, I, we dragged all my credit in. They looked at it, had a five-page resume, and they said, we think we can build a degree out of this. So my, my actual degree that I have now is a bachelor's in art uh, in entertainment writing and production. Aha. Wow. You really backed into that career. Yeah, well, actually, what it was was when when I threw the resume on the table, the first page was like the military and 30 years at Lockheed Martin. The next four pages was my television series, uh, half a dozen radio shows I worked on in D.C. Remember, I had a day job at Lockheed 
But uh, my my vocation was community theater and broadcasting. So I made I made cable program. I worked on several cable programs. The the one I worked on for two years and seventy some odd episodes. That was the my, the one I was the executive producer of. And then um, uh, I did. Uh, I was part of a, a couple of comedy radio teams. I ended up being a three year talk host on a business talk radio station down there on the weekends. Um, and I was the uh, I was the operations manager for the business talk station. So I mean it was it was kind of an interesting gig having a day job over Lockheed and working weekends at the radio station. It was very interesting. You know, and I was single, so like I had no life, as they say. And then when I was in the monastery, again, Buddhist nuns don't run around drinking and chasing people. Well, I would think not, yeah. You know, when, when I was in the military, I was in AFRTS the entire time. Oh, my God. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm very familiar with AFRTS. I, I tried very hard to to um, get a gig with them when I was stationed in Korea. Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, well, I would think you could have at least volunteered for it. They'd always take volunteers. Where were you in Korea? Yongsan? I had just come out of Vietnam, and I was stationed out of Yokota uh, Air Base in Japan. I was part of a mobile telephone crew, and um, you got to understand this is in 1972 um, the Pueblo incident was only about five years before, and uh, the deal was uh, the military figured out how how badly the telephone and communication system was in Korea during the Pueblo incident. It was all put in in the, in the early 50s, you know. So I was part of a mobile telephone uh, construction team, and we were there putting in a whole bunch of uh, Audubon trunk lines and things like that all through the country. And uh, so I was there, and then uh, I literally found myself home on emergency leave because my hometown got wiped out in a flood. And uh, I was living on the economy in um, Kunsan. And uh, I rolled over one morning in my hotel room, and I turned on the little transistor radio I had there to listen to uh, Armed Forces Radio, and the, the newscast went something like, uh, it was a tail end of one, and Governor Rockefeller has sent troops into the cities of Corning and Elmire to prevent looting. I'm going, what? <laughs> I was from Corning. And uh, so I jumped on a bus, went into the base, to the chow hall, and got a copy of Stars and Stripes, and there was the traffic circle up the, up the road from where my parents live, and it three-quarters submerged underwater. So I asked, for a, I asked for an emergency leave to go home, and uh, I managed to get myself assigned to Rome Air Force Base uh, as a temporary assignment and uh, to help my family. And uh, after about four months, uh, the Air Force just decided it was time to, you know, they were trying to uh, reduce the force anyway after the Vietnam War. So they just said, hey, we're going to give you an honorable discharge, Sarge. You know, <laughs> and that, that was it. I was out. That's how all that came to be. Okay, well, I've been listening to many of uh, your other interviews, you know, in, in getting ready to talk with you and do an interview, and I noticed how much we had in common, because I, I'd been in the Air Force, and uh, I'm a contemporary of yours. I was stationed at Yakota for a while and, and had friends in Korea, and so and also I know you were in D.C. at the same time I was, so that's been kind of interesting hearing all that. Now, um, let's roll it back to here a little bit. You just got back from a speaking engagement at the 2018 UFO conference. Um, Now, can we talk a little bit about that? I know you were in good company. Linda Moulton Howe, Stephen Bassett, Travis Walton, Nick Pope, and and I understand Jacques Vallée was there, which is a real coup. So how did that go, Cheryl? Was it uh, pretty good? Yeah, it was a very well attended. In fact, they were were maxed out um, from from a, a attendance standpoint. Basically, this year, since it, we we literally officially outgrew the facility. It was held at the uh, Wicopa uh, Resort and Casino. It's out on a, a, a um, Native American uh, reservation outside out there in Scottsdale. Um, the the people who were there from a speaking standpoint were absolutely fabulous. Um, of course, you know I don't didn't get to stay and listen to everybody, but anybody I didn't listen to, I bought I bought one of the DVDs that was available, uh, so that I could I could come home and watch it, uh, because there was a certain amount of time. Like after I spoke, I was one of the opening speakers. I was like the second speaker to speak on Wednesday, and uh, I had to spend a certain amount of time in the in the dealer suite, so to speak, you know, uh, hawking the book and that kind of thing, you know. But um, I, I had a good time with it, um, good presentations. One of the things I found most interesting is uh, at this convention, uh, they have a, uh, an experiencers 
morning meeting. It's sort of like an AA meeting in the early morning hours, around 7 o'clock in the morning. And, and the first time I ever went to it, I expected to go in there and, I mean, I was pressed and technically I shouldn't have been there, but I asked for permission from the psychologist who ran it, you know. And I, the first time I went there, and it's about three years ago, I expected to see uh, 25, maybe 30 people crying in their coffee about being probed, you know. And when I went into this meeting, there was 150 people in there, and it had all the energy of a tent revival, and it was not like I expected, and the conversation was not like I expected. And so I had permission to sit in there again with them on the condition that I did not write about what, you know, what was said there stays there type of thing. And uh, I enjoyed it thoroughly. It was very eye-opening for me. So that was kind of a highlight for you, getting to listen to some of the experiencers? Well, it was something I did every day there because it gave me, I got to hear a lot of different people's stories about their personal contact with E.T., um, as far as just talking with some of the other uh, speakers and things, um, I did get to sit down, especially in the dealer's room, I did get to sit down and shoot the breeze with various people. Um, I did get to sit down and talk to Bryce Zabel, and he was one of the writers for Dark Skies, the old TV series Dark Skies, and he was there. And I actually bought a copy of one of his autographed copy of one of his scripts, and uh, I had delightful television production talk with him. Um, I had another night. I hadn't talked to uh, Travis Walton in about three years, so it was nice to sit down and have a cup of coffee with him as well. Um, and of course, uh, J- uh, Jennifer Stein, the producer that made the movie there about uh, Travis, uh, she was there, had a couple of great conversations with her. And plus, I think what was also special for me in the past year since my book about UFO statistics came out. I've done a ton of podcasts and and, uh, radio interviews and things like this, and a lot of people in the UFO community who have these shows, people like yourself, um, showed up at the convention, and, you know, we all went out and had a cup of coffee or a bite to eat or something like this, or sometimes we just sat out there in the the lobby and and just chatted uh, chatted up a storm, you know. It was a lot of fun. You you sound kind of like you're going to segue more and more into maybe writing about, um, in a fiction sense probably, more stories and maybe uh, screenplays or something? Well, okay. Uh, let me explain. Uh, I had a number of people come up to me and say, well, what's going to be your next UFO book? And I looked at them and, and, and I shook my head and said, this may be the only one. And they said, what do you mean? You're on a roll here. And I said, look, I'm not, making a, 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 I'm not going to be making a living or a career writing UFO books. This seemed like something worthy of writing. But uh, right now, I just, uh, now that this book is out and doing very well, um, I need to go back to the fact that I've got uh, a novel sitting over there that needs to have final editing. I've got... Uh, uh, three or four novellas sitting over there need final editing. I've got a dozen short stories that need editing. And by the way, somebody's invited me to possibly write a treatment for a TV show. You know, so uh, I got other things to do. You know, yeah. Um, UFO writing is not the only thing I do. In fact, uh, okay, it's not a big secret that I'm a transsexual person. Right. And uh, in the published book of plays that I wrote. Um, I wrote two plays that were gender related. I see. But the book had eight plays in it. Only two of them were gender related. Mm-hmm. And I know some people, like the UFO community, people in the gender community, tend to they do all their writing in just that genre. And I, I didn't. I only did two in the gender. That's all I had in me. That's all I wanted to talk about. So, eh. Right now, I've got other stories to tell. One of the things we are talking about doing, though, is I've been writing my column for uh, five years in July. Yeah. That's a weekly column. And uh, what Linda is think this is my wife, uh, what she is uh, in the process of doing is she has collected out what she feels to be the best of New York skies. And uh, she's going to package them up as a collection of UFO stories in New York State. Uh-huh. Kind of an anthology, huh? Yes, very much so. And uh, all of them were in the five to 600 word range. So, um, you know, 25 or 30 of those things will uh, will make a nice, a nice little what I call a tourist trap book. You know, the kind when you go to a tourist trap, they always have the, the best ghost stories of the state or something like that, you know. Yeah. When I first got to Michigan, that's one of the first things I bought were, the, you know, the, the areas in Michigan that were these hot spots for interesting stuff. I mean, sure. 
Sure, there's always a market for that. Well, I I understand that you that definitely is an area that a lot of your energy is in right now because you're a creative person and that's what you need to do. You need to create. Now, with a background in theater and television writing and such, you're clearly a creative person. And creativity is a noted left brain activity, but obviously you need specialized analytical skills to create your book. And that's a left brain function. What was it in your aerospace career or your stint in banking that honed your skills to take on a big data project that eventually became the UFO sightings desk reference? I was an analyst within, uh, within Lockheed Martin for a long time. So I worked with a lot of spreadsheets. I worked with large data. Okay. Looking for looking for anomalies and things, and there's an art to that as well as a science. And uh, I was very good at it, and and uh, spotting small patterns of things. And uh, so when it came time to start working with UFO stuff, there was so much material out there. I found that uh, it was just a matter of applying those skills to that. Um, I ended up having to write a little bit of code. And when we first started working with the UFO data, it was so messy. Um, that we literally had to write, uh, Linda and I both had to write process. Uh, and, and we were both a couple of former government contractors. She was worked for a firm who um, supplied research librarians and management to government libraries. And, of course, I worked for Lockheed Martin. And, of course, we always working on various contracts. A lot of different people with different skills support contracts. And uh, so we both realized we needed to write what we were doing down as we were learning how to do it. And that's that's how the book came about. Yeah, now see, you just talked about writing code. Now see, you didn't just drop on earth learning how to write code. That was one of those highly specialized skills that enabled you to be able to create systems to ingest data and make sense of it. You don't just, you know, Google it. Where did you learn that code writing? Uh, I, I was writing programs back in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, I was one of those early people who had a little computer on a bench in their garage kind of uh. thing that they built by, from home, by, by themselves. And um, in those days, if you wrote programs, you were either writing in basic or you were writing in machine code. Mm-hmm. And I, I got to be a very good machine code writer back in the day. Wow. Um, these days I write some, I can still write some script stuff for like, uh, Excel or something like that. But, you know, I, it's not something I do every day. I'm not a, I'm not a data head from, I don't write code and script all the time now. All right. Uh, let's segue into your book. Okay. Now you just published that. I, I think it was late spring last year, 2017. I tell you, this thing weighs over two pounds. It, it's 359 pages long of which 320 of it are charts, graphs, and statistical data. This book is charts and graphs and numbers and because it's a reference book. And your desire was that when you and Linda wrote this, from what I understand, you wanted these things to be available in libraries across the nation and have a resource for people who are doing UFO investigation activity and writing and presenting information. And um, man, my hat is off to you because this really is, as far as I I know the only work of its kind, Um, raw data from several sources that you put into spreadsheets and crunched and determined the frequency and distribution and shapes of reported UFOs. Of course, it was just 2001 to 2015, but my God, what was it, 120,186 raw reports you ingested on that? Yep. God. You know, we used to talk a lot. My group used to talk, man, it would sure be nice if somebody could just get a bunch of that data together and crunch it down and make some sense of it. And da-da, you did it. <laughs> what was what was interesting is it started out, uh, because I write a column, it started out as I was just collecting the data and adding them up for like cities or counties in New York State where I was writing. I had to have something to write about every week. And um, and then I spoke at the 2015 International UFO Congress. And uh, I had a professor, Dr. Gordon Spear, come up to me during the mixer. He says, any possibility you could put county data to all that? And particularly for the Hudson Valley in New York. And I says, why? And he told me. And, and I said, oh, wow, there was a research project for something they were 
doing in the uh, in the Hudson Valley. And I said, well, that's a tall order. Uh, one database doesn't even collect county data, and the other one does, but they do it badly. And uh, so I said, let me see what I can do. So I went home. This is uh, February time frame of 2015. I went home. And I spent a couple of months just doing New York State. Now we're talking about 4,200 records at that time. And uh, it was uh, it was a lot of work. Uh, we didn't know what we were doing. We did, you know, trying to look up county data was like onesie twosies on Google, and that was a bad way to do it. And over time, we figured out a fast way of doing it. And when we put county data to the to the information, suddenly we were seeing patterns in New York State that none of the New York State investigators knew or understood. Uh, I'll give you an example: out by Lake Erie. Buffalo, New York, Niagara Frontier, that area, okay? Everybody knew about the Lake Erie effect. Lots of UFO sightings at, around Lake Erie and up around the Niagara Falls area, okay? Everybody knew that. But when we put the county data to it, suddenly we saw a cluster up around in uh, uh, Monroe County, which is essentially Rochester, New York, and that's on Lake Ontario. And we had people coming away saying, wait a minute, Cheryl, maybe we got a Lake Ontario effect, you know, and suddenly people who are saying, oh, Pine Bush is the capital of UFOs on the Hudson Valley, you know. Well, no, actually, Suffolk County, Long Island is the capital of UFOs in New York State, you know. Uh, by a large margin, five other counties have far more sightings than Pine Bush does. So um, this was sh- rattling the New York State investigators. So in October time frame of 2015, Linda and I were sitting down in our favorite pub discussing this over a pint, as they say. And we said, look at all the wild stuff we found. You know, what if we did this for the whole country? And we just sat there and stared across each other, across the table saying, we must be nuts. It'd probably take a year to do, you know. And but we but the thing is, we were both former government contractors, so we were used to writing process. You guys were a perfect fit. That's what you guys already did, really, right? Yeah. See, so having both been government contractors, her with a, a service that provided uh, research librarians to the government, and me working for Lockheed as a, as an, an analyst, uh, we we had a ballpark idea what had to be done. Linda Linda had the scientific background from being a research librarian. I mean, we're talking she used to work for the National Academy of Science, and she was a head librarian at the Environmental Protection Agency for, for 14 years. Smart lady here. Okay, so uh, she gave me the guidance, and I started crunching the data. And um, uh, it, it ended up taking us 16 months just in 2016, you know, the, to, to get that book out. Um, also, if you want to consider the, developing the process for doing it, uh, we we had literally we had literally written notes. This is how you crunch the data. This is how you clean it up first. This is how you sanitize it for this or sanitize it for that or fix this problem. How you add the county data and things like this. And we came up with a very fast method. Where New York State, when I did it in two, the early 2015, took me three months to do. I did it in uh, a day and a half. Uh, when I actually did the book, uh, California took a four day weekend, but I did states like uh, Iowa and North and South Dakota in an evening, you know, that kind of thing. So we had a, a written process for how to do this. And a lot of people don't understand that having an, a designed process for cleaning up the data was so critically important. Uh, right now, I have the entire database, the two combined MUFON and National UFO Reporting Center databases. From the 2001 to 2015 time frame, um, I have a database now that I've cleaned up even more. And what we couldn't put in this book was we took you down to the, we took you nationally, we took you to the state, and we were able to take you down to the county level for those 15 years. Uh, I literally have the ability right now on my laptop that you give me a state, you give me a county, and I can tell you the municipal breakdown of sightings within that county. Right. But I think the process you put in place is noteworthy. That you had to kind of invent the wheel for that, I would say, to crunch all of that down in the way you did. Now, I want to talk a little bit about um, the idea that 
you and others have said that UFO sightings are increasing. Now, first of all, let me say that the only caveat I have with this work is that this is raw data. And having been a UFO investigator and a researcher since uh, 2012, and I've done probably close to 80 cases now, I know that an awful lot of raw data is misleading in that some people just misidentify common things and... um, They're seeing stuff up there that in the last 10 years, we've put so much more up in the heavens and there are satellites whizzing about and there's the International Space Station, which is flying along and and the Soyuz is hooking up with it or some other, you know, SpaceX dragon is hooking up. And so people are looking up in the skies and they're seeing this thing go past and another one shortly going right with it and connecting and they're seeing spy satellites that are flying in constellations that they are writing UFO reports about it being triangular craft and such. So I know that some of the information, a portion of that, that you have ingested into this study. Now we have to talk about how you parse making sure that this is reliable data, knowing that there's a portion of it that is not anything unusual if somebody were to just do a cursory look into it. What's your thoughts on that, Cheryl? Okay. Um, I had a lot of invest- senior investigators come after me with a pitchfork and uh, say, well, you didn't vet them, okay? And Yeah, you and, couldn't. You couldn't vet them. No, no. I, I would have needed a and time nobody machine. Did. I would have needed a time machine and a small army of people to go back there and vet every one of those things. That was never the objective. Uh-huh. And that's what everybody misses. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a couple of things you have to understand when you look at the uh, look at the data, especially on the bar charts. Uh-huh. First thing, there are there's an artifact with what we call an artifact of reporting. Yeah. Uh, it looks like, give me an example. Um, uh, in the early in the early 2000s, 2001 through about 2004, 2005 time frame, that there was only about uh, 3,000 of these things reported a year. And then it jumps up again from around 2005 up to about 2010 or so. It jumps up again. And then it jumps up one more tier from about 2011 up through present day. Uh All right. Well, I try to explain to people that this is an artifact of reporting. It it directly correlates with people having broadband capability to report these things. Uh Okay. Point one. Point two, I didn't care about the unvetted data. We were doing what we call big data analysis. It didn't matter. These were all reported UFO sightings. We knew some percentage of it was baloney, but we also knew that somewhere in that stack of hay, yeah. there was a handful of hay that tasted like strawberries. <laughs> Okay, and probably, you know, and the best investigator sat down and told me uh, we we agreed at a number of around six or seven percent, you know, it was probably and I had one chapter of analysis in there. I said, look, maybe only about seven percent of this stuff is is unique, but seven percent of one hundred and twenty one thousand sightings is still um, a huge number, you know. Uh, so you feel that that you can still uh, pretty much consider that um, even though these are raw reports that have not been investigated, that you can still assign fairly confidently that seven to ten percent ratio of these sightings could very well be considered anomalous. From what I've seen, and I'm going to say this, I'm going to say this very carefully. Uh huh. My numbers suggest, and not in this book, I don't say this, but this has come out since this. I'm saying about one in 50 people reports. You know, you you go to a UFO conference, they say one in 10 people report. Uh But they usually do that at a UFO conference where you're essentially preaching to the choir. Right. Okay. Um, I've analyzed other data that suggests that maybe it's more about one in 50 and I've had other investigators think it's about 140, 1 to 60, something like that, okay? Wow. All right. When you jack those numbers back, uh, proportionally back against the same numbers, instead of having that 15-year period have 121,000, uh, the number starts showing up more like a uh, about 600,000 over that 15-year period, or essentially 700,000 a year, okay? Now, 
Uh, does that mean they're every one of them is some exotic off-world or interdimensional craft? No, not by a long shot. Right. What we were doing, and the reason we don't care about the vetting, we were doing big-scale analysis, big data, okay? We found things in the data that nobody knew. Yeah, let's talk about that. Okay, there was the late John Keel, author of the Mothman Prophecies, mm-hmm. okay? Uh, he came out, when, 40 years ago, came out with the, um, the Wednesday Phenomena. All the UFO sightings can peak on Wednesdays. Well, okay, there's two schools of thought. One was the government tests all their experimental aircraft on Wednesdays. That was one theory. The other one was that the UFOs just seem to come on Wednesdays. Well, the problem is he was working with a very small data set of about 1,000 or less sightings. Okay? And it seems to be uh, predominant from the southwest. Okay? So what happened is, because it's a small data set, it's skewed one way. Now, we had 121,000 sightings, and we ran that that whole crunch for what day of the week, and it holds up. It's pretty stable all week long, statistically flat. It starts to peak up a little bit on Friday, jumps up about 9% on uh, Saturday night, and goes back down Sunday to about, about the same as Friday. Okay, and one of the things we came away with was this is about leisure time and temperate weather controls the sightings Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to some degree. Now, another thing we discovered was the time of the month. Now, we had plotted New York State and knew that it all started really ticking. It was stable all year long, a certain number of quiescent. These are the dog walkers and smokers, okay? Yeah, yeah. And and then we get out to around... June, it starts going up. July and August are through the roof, and then it comes back down. June, uh, September comes down to about what June is, and then it comes back down to that quiescent level, okay, for the rest of the year. Uh-huh. The problem is, we thought that's the way it was every place, that it peaks up in the summertime. And I had already done all the crunching on the book and had the charts handed over to Linda, and she was laying it out like a government report, you know. And she looked over the terminal at me and said, hey, did you notice there's a latitude difference with these monthly sightings? And I said, whoa, 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 what are you talking about? And if you start going down in mid-Atlantic states and go all the way across the country, that peak in July and August starts flattening out. Get down into deep south states, and, and the sightings during a month for a monthly cycle are um, roughly statistically flat. What you're saying there is they don't peak on the weekends down there a little south? No, 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 no. I'm talking in the month, during the month. Oh, uh-huh. Oh. Okay, during the months, okay? January through December. And if you're in a northern state, it peaks in July and August. You move down to like a state like Maryland or any state all the way across about the same latitude, that peak starts coming down towards that statistical flat line. And then if you go into the deep south states, Florida all the way across to Southern California, it's statistically flat. And the only, the only two states that doesn't apply to are Alaska and Hawaii. In, fa- in fact, Alaska's a, a, a chart looks very much like New York State, but it's upside down. Because in the middle of the summertime, the sun's up all the time, and they suffer from white nights. Right, right, right. So they have most of their UFO sightings during their darker months. Okay, now let's now explain to me. I'm, I'm <clears throat> Forgive me, but I'm not quite getting this latitude thing. If uh, As it moves across... The, the center and lower portion of the states during these months, then it's all, the, the sightings do not increase during those periods you thought they would? If we're in, in a northern state, I will say New England or out in Dakota or, or, or Oregon or Washington state, the peak months for sightings are in the June, July, August time frame, September time frame, with July and August being through the roof, okay? Yes, and the rest of the year is flat. Uh, has got a, a flat number. We'll say some, maybe twenty percent of all the numbers. And, okay? and now wait, all Cheryl. Right. Cheryl, and you're saying that because people in the northern climes are going to be out looking at the heavens more in the time periods that that is more conducive to human activity outdoors, right? Warmer summertime, summertime yeah. in northern and, climes. In fact, when we determined that back when I was working just in New York State, everybody everybody told I did that in one of my articles. And everybody said, "Well, duh, Cheryl, that's summertime," you know. And, and I said, okay, fine. But I made the poor assumption there that, oh, well, I suppose it's like this every place. But I did not take into account that the climate in, uh, further south is more temperate. And I didn't take into account that the deep south is very, uh, very temperate year-round. 
Uh, so that's just saying that when when temperature is more temperate, human beings are more prone to be outside and tending to look around uh, the skies more. And that's why you found the flattening out because of the temperature. Yes. So, it, it, so one of the conclusions Linda and I talk about in the book is our conclusion is most of the UFO sighting reports are driven by leisure time, that's the day of the week kind of thing, you know, or when people are off, uh, or temperate weather. Now, the only exception to that is, remember, your dog walkers and smokers are out day in, day out, rain or shine, okay? So they're the people who establish the baseline. But as far as everybody else, it's fair weather viewing and availability to, to do it. Now, I, I've had some radio announcers from some of the commercial radio stations. Well, Saturday night, they're probably all drugged up uh, or drunk or something. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Have you, and I tell these, these talk hosts, I said, have you ever filled out a UFO reciting report? And well, no. And I says, well, it's like filling out a credit application, and drunks and druggies don't fill out something like that. Now, okay, Cheryl, now that tells us a little something about about uh, climate and the latitude and such and time of year. Now, let's examine some of these areas that, that are in, like like the northeast region. You know, when you have just a smattering of sightings there in the northeast region across the year, and then you've got this gigantic amount in New York and Pennsylvania. I mean, New York is 51, 5,141, and Pennsylvania is 5,176 in a time period. And... Uh, the rest of the area around there, Vermont and New Hampshire and Maine and all that, is relatively quiet. And so you also see that in, in these regions. You broke your, your um, reference down to regions northeast, south region, midwest, mm-hmm. and west region. And so then you have these these things that are skewing in that uh, out in the northern climbs up there near Maine. And it's cold in New York, as I know you know, and still... People are seeing at a kind of an outsized number stuff in the sky in certain areas. And, uh, and it seems, you know, kind of to correlate to being on a coast, being near water, but not necessarily. Texas, for example, is nowhere near an ocean. The Gulf is a fair amount from most of Texas. And Texas in the south region has 7,058 sightings in that period, that 2001 to 2015. And they are like the big dog. Florida is, oh, Florida's even bigger. That's right. Florida's 7,787. Uh, What's that uh, tell us? But Florida has half the pop, and people would say, oh, it must be driven by population. And that's not true. Texas, ha- Texas has twice the population of Florida, but yet Florida has more reported sightings. Yeah, now you think that's because of the water? No, no I'm not going there yet. Um, well, bear with me a moment. Some of the other top 10 states, we did a chart in the book where we compared the popu- the sightings on a sim- two states that were of similar size and similar amount of sightings. And the, fe- they're in the states that had, the, these states had vastly different populations and they had similar numbers in the, you know, four or 5,000 range, you know. So, I mean, uh, population is an easy knee jerk, but it's not, it's not the entire answer. Water is, is, is considerably more of an answer, and I'll explain that why. In New York State, we did a chart here uh, from the counties that bordered the St. Lawrence Seaway, Lake Ontario, and down to Lake Erie to the end of the St. Lawrence Seaway. And then we also did the counties that bordered the Hudson Valley from uh, Lake Champlain all the way down to the Atlantic Ocean, Okay. And they represented 50% of uh, the sightings for New York State. And basically what it worked out was like 20, uh, 20, uh, 19% up on the St. Lawrence Seaway and about 32% going down the Hudson Valley. So together it was about 50% of the sightings in New York were on these two major waterways. If you, if you have the book, if you look at the census charts in uh, one of the early uh, chapters there where, we're taught, we, where we got the yeah, census information. Yeah, I got census regions and divisions on page okay, 15. Okay, now look at, look, at the census, look at the census regions. There's a little map where they got the, the, the map of the breakdown areas. Look at the Great Lakes. If you look at the Great Lakes states, the numbers are in the thousands around those states. Move two states away and it falls into hundreds. Well, that buttresses the argument that it has something to do somehow correlating with bodies of water. Is that is that? Yes, yes. I'm 100% there with you. Yeah, absolutely. That's what the numbers seem to show. 
Now, what do you make of that? Uh, well, where do we put that? Based on some, well, I'll tell you. Uh, based, after talking to Lou, Lou Elizondo last week, um, yeah, they know there's a, there's a lot of activity in the water. Okay, and uh, he told me so. But people aren't seeing things in the water so much. They're seeing things in the sky, and they seem to be, the people who are seeing things seem to be near water that are seeing things in the sky. Okay, let me give you one more hook on that, though. Remember, if you're around big bodies of water, okay, the, the amount of light pollution is a lot less as well. Well, not in California. Oh, well, yeah, okay, looking out over the ocean. Well, I can't talk to Kel. It's not going to be like this in every single case. The coast, though, when you're looking out over the water, yes, there's less light pollution because you're looking into an area that doesn't have cityscape skies. When you're up there in Michigan, if you look over by the by the Great Water, uh, you're gonna you, you notice it's darker. You know, just where I live near Cadillac, it's very excellent skies for viewing. Yeah, yes, in certain parts of the country, you have excellent skies for viewing. Certain parts, you don't. California is exceedingly light polluted. Mm-hmm. New York is exceedingly light polluted, and yet there's a huge amount of sightings in exceedingly light polluted areas. Well, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you something that we discovered recently. This is a discovery we, we've made in the last month, okay? Yeah. And Dr. Gordon Spear helped me with it. Um, we, did, we did six states, and we analyzed them in terms of sidereal time. Uh, that's astronomical time. Okay. Now, theoretically, if it was all baloney, all kooks, nuts, and fake reports, the, the numbers should have been statistically flat. Uh-huh. Okay? And the question we had asked, is there a particular astronomical time that people see these UFOs? And quite frankly, we didn't expect to find anything. Uh-huh. Okay? It was just an academic exercise. And it took a lot of work to do it, but we, uh, he did it. And uh, guess what? Uh, 18, uh, 1745, or we'll say 1800, six o'clock astronomical time. That happens to be when the galaxy is directly overhead over any one particular area. That's when most of the sightings are, and it was consistent. What? Yep. So what? What is that saying? We don't know. They had they had Gordon shaking in his boots. Hmm. And I had me shaking in my boots at one point when we realized what the implications were. Okay, that means that if the the galaxy happens to be overhead, and it doesn't matter whether it's daytime or nighttime, that's the time when it happens to that's the happens to be the peak time people are reporting UFO sightings. And remember, sidereal time is dependent is is four minutes uh, less than clock normal clock time. So it means it's it's happening four minutes earlier tomorrow. And four minutes earlier the day after that. So uh, thirty minutes, uh, a week from now, that uh, a star that was overhead today, right now, it would be we'd have to wait thirty more minutes for it to 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 show up. Okay, so we don't know what this means. It, it's a relatively new preliminary finding, but it's interesting. Yeah, I I don't even I don't even know enough to ask a question. <laughs> well, let me give you one more tidbit to go with it. If we were in small sample states, we got a really clear picture of this. It goes along real flat and slow, right, all the way across the timeline from from uh, zero zero, uh, um, uh, you know, essentially midnight uh, sidereal time over to uh, it starts creeping up and it, go, it peaks up at uh, eighteen hundred when the galaxy is overhead. Okay, and what we noticed was most states that the smaller states. We get a good, clean, clear picture of that. California had a lot of noise at the other times, which suggests to us that lots of the other sightings in California, that 15,836 sightings, may be um, that baloney, uh, baloney sightings that you're talking about, the, the unvetted junk. Hmm. That's what it suggests to us. That's just an indication, but just, you know, thought you should know uh-huh. that. Huh. Well, that, that would be an interesting thing thing to see in print in itself. And you speaking of California, you know, I saw that for some reason in California, uh, it only listed to 2012 instead of 2015. It was t- 2001 to 2012 rather than 2001 to 2015, which the other ones did. Where did it say this? Where did this say this? Was it on the graph or was it on the, uh, was it on the table? 
On page 66, when you're looking at the, uh, it's the first page when you turn to California data. The chart only you know, shows you know, 2012. We made a few, we made a few mistakes that got through and ed- got through editing. If you go out and look at Pennsylvania, you know how on the top of each state's page we have a, a ranking. Right. You know, a number 10 of 51. Pennsylvania, we didn't put the number. We, we, we gave you the 51, but we didn't tell you it was number five. Well, did, did you figure in the three other years of data from the California? No, no we did. That's a, that's a graphical mistake. The graph is wrong, but the number is correct. If I wasn't sitting here with a phone in each year, I'd, I'd open the book and look at it, but I can't. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the input is, the graph is uh, not representative, but the input that you use when you crunch numbers did include 2015. Yes, 2013, 14, yeah. and 15 data. Got it. Okay, good. Yeah. All right. Well, now, what other big surprises did you and Linda find, Cheryl, when you were looking through this data, you know, when it first kind of you sat down and you spread this stuff out and said, good Lord, what are the surprising things fell out of this data mining for you? Well, remember when we put the, I told you about the monthly chart, you know, that was January to December Uh for every state. Uh Well, a number of my New York state investigator friends had told me that was a stupid chart. So they did, they, they recommended we didn't put it in the book. But we did anyway, and that's how we discovered this latitude difference. For one, that was a major discovery. That's that's you know, I credit Linda with that discovery. Uh-huh. And the other thing we found was if you went down to Florida, remember I told you the southern states were statistically flat, right? You know, it's bumpy, like it's bumpy, but it's it's statistically flat. When I say it's statistically flat, is what I mean is that, that for the southern states. Um, you go along and look at the numbers. It's pretty. It's not 100% level, but it's pretty level. It's going across. You know, may, oh, maybe only on the chart. It's only going up a couple of percent every every year. It's going up and up and down, up and down, up and down, within the months. Okay, you go back to the, the last page on every state. There's a there's a monthly graph. The second to the last page on. I've got UFOs by month in California, for example. Okay, uh huh. Okay, yeah, get get away from California. Okay, all right. California will skew you. Um, go to Florida. All right, just a second here. I'll give you a good. I'll give you a good example of temperate weather. All right, uh, UFOs by month, Florida, page ninety-eight. Okay, okay, now look at this. January and December are peak months. Uh, I see. Yes. That's because the snowbirds go down there, and they're out down there in that lovely Florida weather from New York and New England, and they they look up and say, "Wow, what a clear, beautiful night! What the hell's that?" You know. And that's that's how, that's what happens. So the snowbirds are down there. The change of population also leisure time for vacationers. So it is uh, leisure time and temperate weather again. Now notice in the summer months in Florida when it's exceedingly hot down there, it starts going in the pit, doesn't it? Well, July is a huge spike though. There's also visitors down there then. Okay, but if, uh-huh. but notice the rest of the year is kind of the, the numbers are relatively flat. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. That's what I mean by statistically flat. Okay. Okay. And uh, you have these little peaks like that. And now, if you go to a state like uh, Mississippi or something like that, you'll see that 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 state. Oh, I'll give a better example. Go go to New Mexico. Uh huh. All right. Now, what's fun with New Mexico? is you will see relatively flat month uh, number uh, within the month time frames, except September goes through the roof. And what do they have out there in September? The hot air balloon stuff. Okay. September, yeah, really, really jumps there in September. Yeah. Okay. Now, we didn't know what that was about until I literally had somebody at the convention tell me that. Do they fly balloons at night during that thing? Because uh, you could also surmise that if September in New Mexico is that time that they're flying all those hot air balloons, then are people seeing hot air balloons? Maybe. Maybe there are a lot of mis- misreports because people, because people are flying balloons. And most people who report these things are not trained observers. Okay. I hit a lady from uh, Alaska. Now, we talked about Alaska. Alaska has most of its sightings during its darker months and its months that it has um, nighttime, either 100% nighttime or, you know, partial days, okay? And then when you get into the deep summer, when it's what they call white nights, uh, uh, June, July, August time frame, it's just light all the time up there. The sightings were in, light, in the dirt. Because most people see these things yeah, at night. right. Yeah. Hmm. 
Yeah, there's a lot of information in here. You know, I started using it as reference uh, since I do uh, investigations. And I did note that that in uh, Michigan, the sightings are during July. The main sightings, I think, are during July. And I had a sighting in July. And... Uh, and in the more temperate months in Maryland, I remember in September, I had an interesting sighting. And that was that was kind of correlating with that period of time. And so it's interesting to see how some of these things are kind of are cropping up. And you can see uh, some indications of human behavior and when they're out and about and what it is they're seeing and experiencing. If you look at a number of the... Uh, industrial states yeah. for 2008 from a year standpoint, you'll notice there's a bit of a spike there. Yeah. Okay. Now, it, it's a, it's we think it's for two reasons. One, we know for a fact that MUFON drew only a small amount of sightings up until about 2007, 2008, and then somebody, uh, Discovery Channel, did a special about UFOs, and they highlighted MUFON, and thereafter, in fact, I wrote a chapter to that effect. We show a graph where the numbers literally jump up and then track pretty much along with National UFO Reporting Center, but it jumped up 30%. Okay? Uh-huh, uh-huh. The other thing, though, about 2008, which is interesting, is the fact that we had a major, I'm going to say economic layoff kind of thing, and a lot of people were out of work. But, but And there have been some people who, who I've loaned certain data to um, that, have, uh, that have been trying to correlate that to gross national product, employment, that kind of thing. Uh, so a lot of other analysis is, is coming out of this besides what analysis I did. Yeah, I can I can certainly see that. Now, th- this was something I was wondering, and I don't know, is there any way using this information to maybe infer where UFO flaps might occur? I mean, I guess if you wanted to go at a 30,000 foot view, you could say UFO flaps would probably occur in the states that are near large bodies of water, because that's where they're already seeing a lot of UFOs. But that does not necessitate a flap, per se. I was wondering if there was some way to use this information to maybe determine where flaps... You know about a dozen other people. Huh? I had a documentary filmmaker, uh, a real good professional one, come to me, and he wanted to go to states where we could pre- predict sightings. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And I told him I thought he was really barking up the wrong tree, um, but I said, if you really want to do that, go pick any one of the uh, top ten states uh-huh. Okay, and get away from a major metropolitan area, Okay, and you might see it. Um, so that's about the only thing I could tell him. You know, everybody was telling me before the book came out, oh, they all hang out in the desert. Well, yeah, maybe Arizona, maybe, but not not necessarily any place else. Um, uh, They all hang out in Alaska. No, Alaska's in the bottom 10. Oh, Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C.'s rock bottom. Now, remember I said leisure time and light pollution and then, okay, where do you see them in D.C.? You see them in the bedroom communities in Virginia and Maryland. Okay, and this is what you have to keep in mind, everybody. The, the light pollution in Washington, D.C., with all the monuments, you can't see, hell, you can't see serious on a clear night. Uh, it's serendipity when you see these things to begin with. And uh, they don't hang out where people think they hang out. That was author, blogger, Cheryl Costa, talking about her book, UFO Sightings Desk Reference. The more I talked with her, the more I wanted to keep talking with her. So many questions to ask someone who has such a varied and interesting background. So we ended up arranging for a conversation part two, where we could discuss her views on disclosure, her interest in the areas of mind and consciousness, and how that may intersect or play a role in the ongoing UFO phenomenon. Part two of API Conversations with Cheryl Costa is forthcoming. I think you'll want to give a listen. Until then, thank you for joining me for this episode of API Conversations. (music) 
API Conversations is a spin-off of API Case Files. This podcast is a production of Aerial Phenomenon Investigations. The spoken content of API Conversations is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 4.0 license, as is the music heard during this program by DJ Spooky and Scott Holmes. Links to information on this episode of API Conversations are included in the show notes. Be sure to check out our other API Conversations, as well as API Case Files, at www.apicasefiles.com.